Paul is having a real old beating. And yet he's speaking about joy in the course of the things that he's having to deal with. Now that's, that's sort of a human being transcending the reality of our everyday human experience, isn't it? And that sort of transcendent experience is something that, that don't we can learn from. That's why Paul's putting it on show. He's not putting it on show to say, look, pity me. <laughs> he's not having any of that. He's saying, look, there's this rubbish going on. But hey, there's a joy to be found transcending this sort of thing. How? What he's telling us how. And that's the point of what he's doing here. What gives you joy? What gives you joy? The basic underlying assumption Paul makes, which underlines the things he's teaching us today, is that it is a joy, paradoxically, you wouldn't believe this, would you? It is a joy to serve God and to serve his people. Now, we don't see joy as being linked to service. We see joy as being linked to having stuff, don't we? Uh, we see joy as being linked to things going in a certain way for us. And actually, he said, the greatest joy is not to have things for yourself. The greatest joy is in being able to be such a young for somebody else. The joy to serve God and his people. And that's his greatest joy, because he knows that whatever he does in the Lord's name comes under the heading of doing something that's going to last forever. And the trouble with so many of the things that give us joy is that they're not very permanent. Mm. They're temporary, they're fleeting, and then they're not good servants, let alone good masters to us. But the trouble with serving people is it gets to be a bit of a pain, doesn't it? And we live in the midst of what some people have called the aspirin generation. You know what the aspirin generation? I got a splitting headache this morning. Let me tell you, let me share that with you. I got this splitting headache this morning, and as I came in, Helen said to me, Get an aspirin, <laughs> cheer up, get an aspirin. Fair enough, fair comment. But I didn't have any. <laughs> we seem to live in the midst of a generation that, that at all costs wants to get rid of pain, isn't it? That's the big, that's the good thing. And that is something that, you know, it's odd, isn't it? Avert pain, that's our main goal in life. Caleb, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? I thought that aspirin, like, generations people who get in the mood to aspirin. Get what? Get in the mood to aspirin, they can't take it. Getting immune to it. Oh, because you've had it so... Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Well, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? So many of the things that we, we do try and use to deal with the pain are things that their, their effectiveness wears off. More and more and more and more of it, and it still wears off, doesn't it? So, good point, Caleb. And of course, too much aspirin is not good for your liver, is it? Is it your liver? Or is that paracetamol in your liver? I don't, know. don't want too much of it. It's bad stuff. Okay, so we're living in the midst of a generation that's very short term. It's the aspirin generation. Do anything to avoid suffering and avert pain. And there's a problem for us in being surrounded by that if we want to be Christian people, being part of it. Because it, if as Christians we're going to be committed to people, and the Great Commission, I mean, the Lord's marching orders for his people at the end there, he is like to carry on. Just before he goes back to heaven, he says, go out and be committed to people, go into all the world. Teach people how, how to follow Jesus, how to be disciples of Christ. Baptise them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and I'm lying with you to the end of the, end of the age. That's my business, I'll be with you. That's the business I'm in. So, we seem to be committed through, you know, our, our, our sort of final instructions, we're committed to being alongside and sharing with people, our lives with people and being close to people and getting involved and committed to people. The trouble is, that opens you to pain, doesn't it? Like nothing else. It certainly does. It makes you vulnerable to that. Well, if that's what Christ calls every one of us to, because that's his marching orders, get out there to every creature, teach him before. Stuff that's really worth it is often going to hurt a bit, and that's one of the things that's going to hurt a bit. Of course, we avoid pointless pain. That's nonsense. We don't go looking for it. That's a ridiculous thing to do. But how do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of that pain? Paul is talking here about God who comforts the downcast, comforts those who need comfort. And earlier on in, in that passage, he's talking about um, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ being the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. What's the point of that? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. And there's great joy in that. There's great joy in that. 
And that sounds a bit airy fairy, right? They were comforting others with the comfort where we ourselves have been comforted by God, right? I know. I know people who talk like that, especially when they come to subjects like this. It looks a bit airy fairy. But it's pretty rooted in Paul's experience and it's pretty rooted in what he's saying to us. And he's not going to let us get off the hook by going for talking in soft voices without any substance and reality. That's what we're saying. There's Paul's big point for today. In verse 4, the point is pretty near the surface of these two verses. God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we receive from God. Now, I just want to show, don't panic, right? but I'm going to show you the Greek and I'm going to colour code it because it makes a point. Is that okay? Don't let anybody panic, but here it comes. See that sort of lucky orange colour? Right. <coughs> Those there, they're all references to God. So you can see the incidents of the references to God. How much is it about God? Quite a lot. These references here in red, they're references to trouble. Philipsis is the Greek word for trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Red. So where's the orange? Hang on, there's the orange. Mm -hmm. There's the red, trouble. So there's, there's God, right? Three references. Here's trouble. Oh, four references to God, sorry. Two references to the trouble. One, two, three, four, five references to God comforting us in our trouble so that we can comfort others. It's about three things in particular then. It's about God, it's about trouble, and it's about comfort. Is that making sense? I'll put it in English and it's a bit better. There you are, there's a word. Come across wordles? Well, see, computers again, and it's in trouble. Why did you turn it around? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, there's always one I want to turn around. Whichever way you turn it. What this is, it's like a program on the computer, it's got an algorithm in it, that makes bigger on the page the things that are repeated most often, yeah. the text you put in it. Yeah. So it's largely about comfort. And if you put comfort together with comforts, that would be even bigger. It's very much about God. So if you put Father, God, Lord, and Jesus, it's Christ, there he is. Put him on there somewhere, it's largely, largely about him. Comforts. God. Trouble. Okay. First, we need to be looking at the troubles thing. Then we need to look about God in reference to trouble. And then... We look at what the point of all that is. What's the point of it? Because senseless suffering is the worst of all things, isn't it? This uh, Greek word thlipsis is used sometimes with fiery trials, things of that sort, persecutions, fiery testing, trials. It uh, comes from a background of testing metal, where metals are concerned, uh, proving metals and uh, refining metals. So the testing of what's there and the refining of what's there are all in the background to that. And trouble's what you get, isn't it? Trouble's what you get for being human. Um, we live in a world that's troubled. It's a hard world to live in sometimes. And we get trouble for being human in the world. But it, it seems that being a Christian intensifies that. It happens. It comes along. Because there's extras that come with it. It's a feature of general human experience. For the Christian, biblically, it's intensified because people put pressure on you if you're going to be a consistent Christian person. That happens. It comes along. And uh, Paul is saying it's positive. Now that's completely countercultural. In terms of our culture, that is completely countercultural, where the prevention of pain is just about the highest motive in the world. But you know what Jesus says to his followers in John 16 about all this? There he is, he's, a, he's on his last night with them. He's about to be betrayed and taken away and beaten and humiliated and tortured to death, because that's what the cross is about, isn't it? Uh, we've made it sort of a nice little symbol to hang around your neck, but actually, this is death through torture. John 16, he tells his followers, this is not a fruitless endeavor. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. So how has your week been? <laughs> It's been quite a week, hasn't it? In fact, most of the people I don't really think of it haven't even made it here today. And uh, I hope they get the video because, you know, uh, people have had a bit of a beating in the course of this week. Our people have. The point here in John's Gospel is this. Not to spend all your time trying to avoid trouble, the trouble you're bound to have in this world, 
But to spend your time in that trouble, seeking to have the Jesus who overcomes it with you. To hack it, to deal with it, to get through that. And to get through it, as we were saying last time, the point isn't to suffer, the point is to shine. To get through it in such a way that the comfort of God shines through. Now, that's not to say our troubles are minor, that's not to say they're insignificant. They're very significant indeed, but they're very significant indeed because of what they make of us. And what we can make of them. Paul speaks here about all our troubles. There's going to be. There's going to be trouble. God comforts us in all our troubles. Not our puny few little problems, think nothing of it. This is not stoicism. This is not deny the reality of the experience you're having. Far from that. It's come together with the people of God. Come together to God and find your strength to deal with the reality of what you've got. It's not dreamland. It's realistic. That's something important to get a hold of. He is able to comfort us in all our troubles. You've got to get hold of that, says Paul, because the first thing to happen, the first thing to happen to you when, you, when trouble comes on you is, is for... Well, the first onset of trouble is often the first onset of panic, isn't it? Something's come up. <laughs> You're, well, not everybody's built the same way. There are people who think, oh, great, because that's our temperament and disposition. Is that fair? Yes. Argue with me, that's fine, I'm happy with that. No, I am honest, I am. But it can be the case, and for a lot of people it is. There's, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, it's not Superman, it's something, people have an extra chromosome. Oh, what's it called? Yeah, no, that's... Certain, certain regiments have, a lot of guys, a high percentage of guys, who've got extra X, is it? Yeah. An extra X chromosome? And they, oh, you give them a bit of grief and trouble and affliction, they go, great, <laughs> let's do that, you know? <laughs> yeah, we, I know about that. Um, I see where that comes from. We're talking about the, mod, the average run of humanity. And for, <laughs> for most of us, you know, the non end bangers, right? This is. This is. This is. is all, it. This is. Oh, yeah, welcome. Yeah, I'll get to you in a minute. Uh, so, <laughs> this is what you get. If panic does start to happen, mm -hmm. then things immediately start to go badly. They're not going by faith. Because panic and faith are opposites. The opposite of faith isn't doubt, is it? The opposite of faith is fear. And he's the one who's overcome the issues of this world that we're trying to, to trying to deal with. So it's to him we need to be going with the grief that gets thrown out. And fear is the opposite of faith. But faith is what goes to him in trouble. That's the key characteristic of faith, isn't it? It turns to God. It certainly does so against trouble. Well, our trouble, says Paul, is troubles are not being insignificant or small. He knows what he's talking about. Um, to the Corinthians, there are a number of references Paul makes to the afflictions that he's experienced. Um, <clears throat> it's things like uh, physical hardships, dangers, persecutions, the anxieties he experienced as he was getting on with being an apostle. Uh, if you want to for later, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 10. He's going to talk about them in a minute in this passage that we've got in front of us today. He talks about the hardships he, they, 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 that he experienced in Asia, uh, despair in even of life, felt in our own hearts the sentence of death, psychological pressures, where it's going to end up, and so on. You find it in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 12, where he's talking about having treasure of God in jars of clay. We're hard pressed on every side but not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. Always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. And then in 11, in 2 Corinthians 11, he's got more sort of unfolding. And look, this is, this is the pressure. This is what it's like. This is what it's about. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. I've been, I've worked much harder, I've been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Yeah, that flays a man's back, it's an unpleasant experience. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. You know, I mean, rocks. <laughs> I mean, imagine that sort of ex horrendous experience. They thought they'd killed him, they left him to bed and he was 
Yeah. Ridiculous situation. Constantly on the move, uh, or shipwrecked, spent a night and day in the open sea, constantly on the move, danger from rivers, bandits, own countrymen, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, and in danger from frost brothers. I've laboured, toiled, often gone without sleep, hunger, thirst. He's got a list. Right? Here's a guy who knows what he's talking about. He knows the things that he's dealing with, and he says, he's found that in all of these, God is sufficient help for him. In all of them. Because he comforts us in all our troubles. All our troubles. All our troubles. The point about Jesus is that he's been there and he's done it. And scripture teaches us that he's not a high priest who doesn't know what he's there for for us. He's tried and tested in every way, just as we are, but was without sin. Now, okay, as a pastor, every now and again you're looking at somebody and they're going through a bunch of trouble. Okay? So you, you, and you're trying to understand. You know, you're trying to think, because you do. You try to be, but you know, because sometimes that, something happens behind their eyes and they look at you and say, you really haven't got a clue what I'm going through, have you? And you haven't. You haven't. And you'd like to understand, and you'd like to be able to enter into that experience with them, and you're chatting with them, and you're listening to them, but actually you don't understand. And the most stupid thing in the world you can sometimes say to somebody is, oh, I do understand. You don't. You don't. But I know somebody who does. Because he sees and he knows exactly what you're going through, and he's been through being tried and tested in every way, just as we are, but was without sin. And his name is the God of all comfort. His name is Jesus. Now it's not that he's been through every exact same experience, but he's been through every type of trial, type of trial and type of experience. And that's what we're looking at here. Okay, troubles. Paul's got them. They're real. They're for real. They are there. Here's how he's talking about dealing with it. He's saying... The point at which, well, the point at which it becomes a transformed situation is the point at which you bring God into it. It's not unique for Christians to bring God into times of trial and difficulty. Have you noticed that? It occurs to me, when, when trials and difficulties come along, um, God comes into the frame for Christians and for non-Christians alike. Very, very frequently. He comes into the picture. In New Testament terms, there are just two types of people in this world. There are the people who in their trials turn to Christ because they've been turned to him all along, probably. And those who don't, they turn against him. And it's as if times of difficulty come along, and those are the things that focus what's already in your heart towards God. As if, okay, if, if you're living your life of saying, God, get lost, then the coming along of trial and trouble and difficulty is the point at which you say, I'm justified, and say, God, blame you! As Job's wife said to Job, just curse God and die, man. The second, the first lot of people bring God into the frame to, to trust him and turn to him and find strength and comfort and help from him. And the second lot seem to bring him in to the picture to blame him and to rage against him. Because if rebellion is what's in your heart already, rebellion is what this brings out. And Paul says, hang on. I'm talking about the Father of our Lord Jesus. The God that we, he says, go to in our troubles is the God who is the Father of Jesus. The whole experience of suffering and mixing it with faith, it's going to turn out to be a Trinitarian experience, Father, Son and Spirit. But, but bear in mind, that experience of suffering is something we bring to a God who is the Father of Jesus. I came recently across the story of uh, a missionary parent who spent years and years and years in a very hostile culture and a primitive culture in many ways as we'd see it, a closed culture. Very little visible success as a missionary. It was grim, it was hard going. And then through being where he was and doing what he was doing, he found himself alone burying his dead son who died because of something he contracted in that environment. And the guy went out alone and he dug a grave on his own and the villagers watched. And he brought his son's body and laid him in that grave and he filled it in and the villagers watched. And when he filled it in he planted his own face in the top of the, of the earth on the top of the grave and he wept and he wept and he wept. Because by then that was about as much as he could do, you know? And the way the story goes, one of those villagers came over, seeing this, puzzled, came over and pulled at his hair and lifted his head from the dirt. 
saw his face flooded with tears and shouted, the white man is like us, he weeps. He weeps. And from that point on, but only from that point on, the missionary could tell them of the God who also lost the son. And he could tell them of that in ways that they readily received. Our God also lost the son. He is the father of all Jesus. Right? The God who comforts us in fellowship with him is the God who suffered because he committed himself to us. He also had a son. Our people hurt you. Loved ones hurt you and let you down. Leaders disappoint you. But he is the father of our Lord Jesus and we can rely on him. Because he knows what it's about. He is the father of our Lord Jesus. He's the father of compassion. The way the genitive works here in the Greek says this, he is the compassionate father. Now we all try and be fathers and we try and do our best and we try and do our, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right, but we're dealing here with the father of compassion. We can go to him. He's the compassionate father. He's the God of all comfort. Because of who he is. Comfort. Um, does that ring any bells again with Jesus in his last discourses before he went to the cross? glory and stuff. Um, he's there in John 14. He says, I'm going. And the guy says, what? You can't, you can't leave us. What are we going to do now then? You can't just go. He says, okay. If you like me, keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate, it says. He says, advocate in the NIV. Come back to that. To help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, he will be in you. That word advocate is the same word that's used here for comfort. It's the same word. And you get the same word used of God in Isaiah 40, and Isaiah 51, and Isaiah 61, and Isaiah 66. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Luke uses that word, in that Greek word, in, in Luke 2.25. Do you remember Simeon and Anna, the old people up the temple when Jesus is brought in? It says of them, they were looking for the consolation, this word, of Israel. Which is again the comfort that comes about when God delivers his people by sending his saviour. You know, he's a saviour, he's not there to leave you on your own, is he? He's not there to leave you as you are, he's there to save you out of your troubles. And that's the idea. That is not just our theology, says Paul. He is the God who comforts us. That is our experience. Our New Testament theology is not ideas. It works. And it works for us. Now, I guess we think of God being in all sorts of manner of business. Judgment, of course. Forgiveness, yeah. Redeeming lost souls, yeah. But what he particularly is to his tested tried hard times people is that comfort us. He's there to comfort us in all our troubles. The comfort that comes out of his very character. In our trouble, we find fresh, true, intimate fellowship with God through the Spirit. That trouble is a big opportunity, said Paul. In our experience, he says it was an opportunity to find the comfort that God gave. Because we surely live in a world that could do with it. It's the same way to God for others. So we find our way to that. We can help others to find it too. Let me give you an example of that from my experience just this week. There was an elderly bereaved gent in the co-op. Uh, I've known him for a while. He's a son of the soil. And there he was in the co-op. He's lost. He had a wife, and it wasn't brilliant, but she was his wife. And then she died. And he said to me, you don't know what you've got until you've lost. And through my own reflections and thinking through issues of loss and so on, I was able to say, yeah, the thing is, we live as if it's never happened, don't we? came very forced me to, to me a long time ago in an experience of my own. We live as if this never happens. But we've got to live as if it does. Because it does. And in living as if it does, and in preparing our hearts and souls and being ready for this to happen, 
we're ready when it happens. And I can speak to them about finding something of the comfort that we find from God. We turn from sin when we trust in Him and we're walking in through the rubbish that life throws at. So if you're going to live as a Christian, there's going to be trouble. There you go. Uh, you know, you see these American um, tele evangelist type people in. Come to Jesus and have a Mercedes. You know sort of thing? You come across that? Then they just drive you bonkers. They drive you mad because it's so unrooted in reality. You know what I mean? It's, it's unreal. It's unreal. If you're going to live as a Christian, there's going to be trouble. And there's going to be the normal trouble generated by being a human being. You can handle that in a constructive way by learning the walk we've gone through it. And there'll be extras. And you can handle that to benefit. So what can we go through? How can you make sense of it? What is it? This trouble, what is it? It's an exercise for us in finding fellowship with Christ afresh in a more realistic and closer way in the griefs we encounter. And it's therefore an exercise, a training exercise. We'll see there's a place where, uh, in Hebrews it says, um, you know, this, this treat hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons and you're learning. It's an exercise in finding fellowship with Christ in the griefs we encounter. It's a training exercise, learning to find his comfort in our pain. So that we can carry some of the compassion that is essential to the character of God, which we've found and discovered into the world in which we live, where without Christ this pain, suffering and trouble is compounded by its pointlessness very often, not always, very often. And the worst thing that pain and suffering and tribulation can be is pointless. It's a waste. That, as far as I can tell, is the lesson for today out of these verses. For the Christian is not pointless. It takes us back to our God. Because we learn things, we're shaped, we're formed, and we become people there who have something to contribute to a very pained and a very suffering sort of world. Because it is, isn't it? Here's a cheery thought. We have no idea what this week's going to bring yet, do we? Bit of an adventure, really. Try not to all cheer immediately. It's, it's always an adventure. You never know, do you? You never know what this week's going to bring. But do we have a God who can comfort us in our trouble so that we become those who are able to comfort others in their troubles? Not with mere platitudes, fine sounding emptiness, but with the reality of the comfort that we ourselves have received from God in the course of a human life. And that's worth something, isn't it? Somebody came here a few weeks ago and preached for us, having come through a very difficult experience, health wise. And his words had a ring of truth about him, I thought. Because he'd been finding the comfort of God through the distress of those troubles. And I had some authenticity. Let's pray that God makes us, not that we find trouble we don't want, no way, but that what does come our way will be a source of growth, and maturity, and finding in our God things that we can pass on to a bunch of people who need to find his comfort.